experiences. When Louise Brooks was nine, um, she, there was a man who lived uh, down the street, a house painter by the name of Mr. Flowers, a friend of the family. Um, he would often leave popcorn and other treats out on his front porch. Almost like he was trying to capture a rabbit by leaving food and a little trail up to the, to the trap. Um, and she took the bait, and once there, he molested her. And her mother blamed her. What had you done to lure the poor man? Something to that effect. Nice parenting skills, Myra. Molestation charges against the neighbor were never filed. When Louise was 13, the family moved to the big city, Wichita. At that point, she was uh, really uh, bringing in some income as a dancer. At 15, Louise, now a beautiful young woman as well as a talented dancer, found her ticket to fame. She saw the Denishawn dance troupe, and that was a very famous modern dance troupe co-headed by Ted Shawn and Ruth St. Dennis. Not anything like ballet of the time or anything. It was really a, a striking sort of avant-garde dance movement. She moved to New York with the express aim of becoming a Denishawn dancer and she auditioned and was accepted uh, right away. Uh, Miss Ruth ran a tight ship, and she was staunchly opposed to any kind of uh, drinking or uh, carousing and certainly late night dating. And she tried to police the dancers as best she could and did so pretty well with most of them, but not Louise. Ruth St. Dennis dismissed her for having a superior attitude. She was dismissed before the entire company, and it was a humiliation that, that uh, affected her, I think, for a long time. So at the age of 17, Louise Brooks was on her own in the Big Apple. She definitely wasn't in Kansas anymore. After she left the Denishon Dancers, she moved to New York, lived at the Algonquin Hotel, eventually became a chorus dancer, uh, first with the George White scandals. There were a lot of fans hanging out, and the girls were all instructed to uh, turn down any advances. But Louise, of course, uh, was inclined to accept. She was actually evicted from the Algonquin Hotel, she was told, for promiscuity. All right, so Louise liked to, uh, well, she liked to entertain. But this was 1924, and Louise's behavior just wasn't ladylike. At 18, Brooks was lured away from the George White scandals by none other than Flo Ziegfeld, the king of Broadway. She loved Ziegfeld, and he evidently loved her. He had to have loved her to have uh, taken such a problematic little thing out of Louis XIV and placed her directly into the folly. During that period, I think she really started to determine to transform herself. She's having all sorts of new fans every night at the Ziegfeld Follies, and one of them happened to be Charles Chaplin, who had a great three-month torrid affair in New York City and then never saw each other again. She was also involved with George Marshall, who was a laundry tycoon and the future owner of the Washington Redskins. It was also in the 1920s that she met and had an affair with William S. Paley, the founder of CBS. One of her fans had been the Paramount producer Walter Wanger. He'd seen her in the Follies. Wanger offered her a movie contract. So did MGM. And Wanger said, listen, you'd be better off at MGM. And for her usual uh, ordinary reasons, she picked Paramount. She made her first movie a bit part in a film called Street of Forgotten Men. 26. She was uh, one of the most successful of the so-called junior stars. You know, a lot of them fall by the wayside. Louise was one who uh, got wonderful reviews and uh, drew many fans and was recognized for a wonderful talent. Louise gets two thumbs up from film critic Roger Ebert. She comes directly out of the screen and deals with the audience. There is no feeling of acting. There is a feeling of freshness. She doesn't seem to be dated like a lot of silent stars. Louise was just as popular in Tinseltown as she was in New York. Men were clamoring for the chance to date this dark-haired beauty, and Louise was smart enough to take advantage of the situation. Playboy publisher Hugh Hefner has been a longtime fan of Louise Brooks. I think there's no question about what she used her beauty and her uh, uh, sex appeal to achieve what she wanted to achieve, and what she wanted to achieve, in some instances, uh, is rather like, um, you know, answered prayers. Be careful what you wish for, you may get it. Uh, she got the independence for a period of time, uh, but paid a price for it. But one guy finally managed to hold Louise's attention, at least long enough to get a ring on her finger. Louise met Eddie Sutherland on a picture. Um, he was a director, a great comedy director uh, at Paramount. 
Louise and Eddie married in July of 1926. Brooks was 19. Sutherland was 12 years her senior. He really pressured her quite a bit before she finally said yes. Almost as soon as they were married, he went off and did another picture and went off on location and just left her alone. Probably not a good idea when you're married to someone like Louise. I don't think either one of them particularly acted like they were married. I've never gotten the idea that marriage curbed their dating possibilities uh, a bit, either one of them. By 1928, Louise's marriage was a bust, and her reputation for being difficult was making her less and less appealing to Paramount's new studio chief, B.P. Schulberg. This became a problem when Louise's contract with Paramount was up. In 1973, at the age of 67, Louise Brooks sat down to discuss that fateful meeting in a film documentary about her career. I was terribly in love with George Marshall. He was a very rich, young laundry man, and he later became the owner of the famous Redskin football team. He called me one day and he said, tomorrow your option comes up. He called me from Washington. I said, oh, really? He said, yes, Monte Bell, MGM called me and told me all about it. And he said, now look, when you go in to see Schulberg, he's going to tell you that he will keep you on at 750 a week, but he won't give you the raise in your option. And he said, I also know that some guy in Berlin called Pabst wants you for a very famous picture, I hear. And he'll give you $1,000 a week. So you let Schulberg talk, and when he's finished, you say, thank you, Mr. Schulberg, but I'll quit and go to Germany. And that is what I did, much to Mr. Schulberg's surprise. And of course, later he put out the story that I left because my voice was bad and didn't record well. Louise's personality was uh, extremely assertive, for one thing, uh, extremely intelligent. This was her big problem with the male uh, studio executives throughout all of her filmmaking career. None of these men could believe that any girl so beautiful could be so smart. They didn't know what to do with this woman, and she was not gentle with them. Louise would find harmony, however, with G.W. Pabst, one of the most famous European directors of his day. He invited Louise to come to Germany and make a film with him. She went to Berlin, and uh... She said when she stepped off the train and onto the platform and met Pabst, that moment she became an actress because he was the first director to ever really see in her all the possibilities that she had. Louise's first film with Pabst was Pandora's Box. It's now considered among the greatest silent films ever made. Well, it's about a woman who uh, either is or isn't a prostitute. She uh, mesmerizes the son of a publisher and the publisher himself and uh, a countess in one of the first really frankly lesbian characters on the screen and she finally meets this guy on the streets of London she's pretending at this point to be a prostitute and he, he doesn't have any money but she takes him upstairs anyway she's got a heart of gold of course that's the mistake she makes because it turns out to be Jack the Ripper the German reaction initially uh, was uh, not too positive because there had been a search for someone to play that role and Lulu is a character that's quite famous in Germany. So the fact that they imported somebody from America to play this classic German trollop was controversial at the time. I think they found the right and, and perfect person for the role in, in uh, Louise. After completing another film in Germany, 23-year-old Louise decided to return to the United States in 1929 despite Pat's objections. But once again, Hollywood brought out the rebel in Louise Brooks. She turned down roles in the hit films Public Enemy and Bride of Frankenstein. And when sound was added to one of her silent films and Paramount hired another actress to voice her role, she was finished. The word was spread that she didn't have a voice and uh, that she couldn't last in talkies. And so uh, she wasn't officially blacklisted, but it amounted to the same thing. She stayed in Hollywood trying her best to figure out what to do. She had become a non-person in Hollywood. Louise finally decided to return to her dance roots. She took up ballroom dancing. She returned to the thing that she perhaps loved the most. Deering Davis was a Chicago socialite um, millionaire whom she married, and they formed a dance team, and they toured for a number of months and eventually split up. She makes one last film in Hollywood, and it is a terrible B-Western called Overland Stage Raiders. And the only thing noteworthy about it is the leading man, who was John Wayne. And she was a grand 31 years old. 
and in disgust with the industry and the whole business and the phoniness and in the fear that uh, as she had been warned if she stayed out there too much longer she was going to end up as a prostitute she decided I'll go back to Kansas she was opened a dance studio in Wichita in the middle of World War II uh, you can imagine how many students there were uh, and the few that there were she managed to alienate she just was looking for a way to live her life and um, at that time I think she just didn't really have that much direction about what she wanted to do she went back to New York in 1944 had a crummy little apartment on First Avenue near the uh, Queensboro Bridge, 59th Street. It took a couple of sales girl jobs at Saks Fifth Avenue and was not doing well, mostly thanks to the booze. So those were really rough times for her. She was coming to terms with her, her life and, and her failures. Um, even the things that she succeeded at, she saw as a failure in disguise. The question of how uh, Louise Brooks viewed her film career uh, is easily answered by she didn't. She didn't view herself uh, as having a film career. She never wanted to be an actress. She never set out to be an actress. It happened by accident. She wanted to be a dancer. She didn't place any value on it, uh, which was why she could toss it away so casually. Louise Brooks had a way of doing exactly as she pleased without any concern for the outcome. It was this philosophy which may have led to a brief stint in the world's oldest profession, no, not acting. There is some evidence that she was a call girl for a while, uh, working for a madam in New York. The extent of her escort duties and actual prostitution really have been uh, exaggerated. She did this for a very brief period of time. What did last was Louise's bitterness about her Hollywood experience. She became more and more reclusive as the years would go on. She had a select group of friends, probably nearly 20 years, that uh, she never left her apartment at all. Always the survivor, Louise Brooks rejoined the human race in 1956 at the age of 49. Now, James Card, the curator of film at Eastman House in Rochester, went looking for her and found her in New York and brought her to Rochester, showed her her old films. He fell in love with her. He took her to Paris. She was feted at the Cinémathèque Francaise. There was a tour of Europe. She was rediscovered. It was during the 50s, 60s, and 70s that she began writing the essays, which appeared in uh, numerous film magazines. She was able to uncover the filmmaking process and the uh, acting, directing process in a way that no one had ever done before, no one who had actually been acting in this film. Her ability with the language was something that was so extraordinary that it struck everyone who appreciated it. Louise lived quietly, yet still reclusively for many years. Although she'd finally gained the respect and recognition as an actress she deserved and enjoyed newfound status as a gifted writer, Louise didn't seem to care. She liked it on one level, she hated it on another because her health was failing. She had terrible arthritis and she was often in great, great pain. That's why she would go for days and weeks without even getting out of bed. She didn't have to, she would sit there and drink and read and, and smoke. And she was not in good health for several years and finally died in 1985 at the age of 78. Um, died of a heart attack. I guess, died of uh, just being sick of living. I, I think it's probably closer to it. Louise Brooks was quietly laid to rest in a Rochester, New York cemetery in August of 1985. What a life. So what is it about this long forgotten star that people still find so fascinating? I think it's clear why uh, she's much more accepted and appreciated and understood now, which is thanks to half a century of progress in women's liberation, feminism, the male ability to tolerate an intelligent female. It's a kind of a rediscovery for a lot of people. In other words, I think she is not one of the famous stars of Hollywood. You can see an independence and an intelligence that combined with her beauty were qualities that made her particularly attractive, but also one sees a self-destructive quality in it too. She fought the system from the very beginning and uh, she paid a price for it to some extent. The real definitive Louise Brooks statement was the following. She once said, uh, love is a publicity stunt. And making love after the first rapture is just another way of passing the time waiting for the studio to call.